la comunidad de 8.8 Atina por mantenerse con nosotros. Bueno, estamos llegando al cierre de la jornada con la última charla de hoy y llega a cargo de Anchises Moraes de Brasil. ¿no? A ver, paso a presentar a Anchise, ahí está, lo tenemos en línea. Anchise es nacido en ciencias de la computación, adicto al, al trabajo de la seguridad ciberevangelista en el banco C6 Bank, el C6 Bank, perdón, fundador de Security Business en Sao Paulo, Brasil, canciller supremo del de club Garoa Hackers y pertenece al grupo de mujeres eh, como embajador de la TAN en ciberseguridad, director del capítulo eh, Brasil de Cloud Security Alliance y especialista en seguridad y protector del ámbito del ciberespacio. Eh, la ponencia que va a tener con nosotros Achises es sobre un estudio del caso de filtración de datos de Capital One. Eh, en esta investigación tiene como objetivo comprender si los requisitos de cumplimiento que existen son suficientes para prevenir brechas de datos ¿no? y mediante la evaluación técnica de incidentes de violación de datos de Capital One. Eh, en este caso de estudio comprenderemos el modus operandi técnico de los ataques e identificaremos los requisitos de cumplimiento relacionados en base al marco de ciberseguridad de NIS. Bueno, los dejo con Anchise, es tuyo el público. Adelante, Anchise. Hola a todos, muchísimas gracias, Gruber, por la presentación. Uh, yo soy Anchise Moraes, de Six Bank en Brasil. Uh, yo voy a hacer mi presentación en inglés, les pido perdón por esto. Es que como mi español es muy malo, pienso que usted no, no lograría no sé, quedar más de 10 minutos o, o indo en español. Uh, entonces yo voy a hacer la presentación en inglés, ¿ok? Uh, entonces uh, voy a empezar en inglés, ¿ok? So, uh, hello, I'm Anquises. Uh, I'm from the City Bank. I'm also a member of uh, many communities here in Brazil, like uh, Bonsi, Latin America, Women for Cybersecurity, which is a great community to, to support women who want to work or keep working in the cybersecurity field. Okay, so it's a, it's a huge, very important topic in our industry. I'm also a member of the Cloud Security Alliance chapter in Brazil, and I'm one of the founders and a member of the Garo Hacker Club, our very first Brazilian uh, hacker space here in the country. Okay, and I'm very familiar also that there are many hacker spaces uh, around Latin America as well. So it's a great community also uh, to be part of, to support. Okay, so I invite everyone to get in contact with your local hacker space and your local chapter of uh, WONSI, Latin America Women for Service Security as well. Okay, uh, I will start sharing my screen. Okay, uh, compartir my pantalla. So this case study, uh, it's a work that we done uh, in partnership with uh, the cybersecurity team at MIT, so group, group of the MIT is long, okay. Uh, our CTO, Access X Bank, and also Novice, he is also a researcher affiliate at MIT. So we did this job, me, Nelson, and Natasha Borges from City Bank as well, and uh, led by Stuart Madnick. Uh, the intention of this paper was to understand uh, to, to, to create actually a case study of the data breach that happened with Capital One, the US Bank Capital One. And we based on this case study, we wrote down a white paper and it's available online. So here you have the link and the QR codes to have access and to download the paper. So it's freely available. You can just go right now and download the paper while I'm speaking, okay. Uh, and the idea behind this paper was to understand the, the security incident that happened at Capital One and to figure out if the existing compliance requirements that we have nowadays, they would be enough to help Capital One to prevent the cybersecurity incident. Actually, the, the general idea behind this research is a, a broader study to understand how compliance, the existing compliance and regulations and legislation uh, around uh, across the world, uh, they are effective or not effective on helping companies preventing data breaches. 
Okay. So let's go ahead. Uh, as I said, the idea behind this uh, research was to understand the capital, the, the data breach incident that took place with Capital One, the US Bank Capital One in 2019. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and based on the Capital One incident, to figure out if there is uh, enough compliance requirements that would help preventing the, the incident. So we will, first of all, we will take a look at the Capital uh, One incidents, okay, understand the incident, and then figure out which uh, compliance requirements are in place or aren't in place to prevent the incident. So as I said, uh, we, we decided to study the Capital One uh, data breach incident. First of all, because it was a very uh, relevant cybersecurity incident that took place in 2019, okay? Uh, it's very relevant, actually, because, first of all, Capital One is a, is a huge and important uh, U.S. bank. Uh, they are recognized uh, as one of the most technical, skilled, and advanced banks in the U.S., okay? So they have a huge investment in, in technology and cybersecurity, and actually, they are maybe one of the first or the main U.S. bank who decide to move the entire infrastructure, uh, IT infrastructure to the cloud. Okay, so they had a plan to to close uh, all their physical data centers and move everything to the cloud. As far as I remember, they had six data centers, physical data centers. And the original plan was to move everything to the cloud, and actually they did. Okay, so by 2020, they, they had already moved the, their entire infrastructure to the cloud. Okay, so, so because of this, they were uh, a flagship, they were a, a case study uh, at our Amazon website. Okay, they were a relevant uh, AWS customer. And so it's a huge bank, a very technical safety bank. Uh, the first bank to move the entire infrastructure from the physical, traditional on-premise data center to the cloud, okay? And all of a sudden, unfortunately, they had a relevant security incident in 2019 where uh, an, an attacker was able to, to, to penetrate the infrastructure and steal customer data, so they had around 100 million customers affected with their personal and financial data uh, exposed, uh, uh, stole actually. And for example, they their shares, they felt six, around 6% 6 right after the breach was announced. So they, they also had a huge impact to their business. Uh, <clears throat> so if you consider everything, so they are very, it, it's a very relevant uh, incident. Actually, they, they got presentation worldwide by the time of the incident. Okay. Mm. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we we decided to understand this capital and bridge incident in order to figure out if the co existing compliance controls and reg regulations were enough to prevent the breach to, to happen. Okay. So, uh, the, the first question, do we have enough uh, requirements, security threats that would help preventing the breach? If so, we believe if the, the, the requirements were well implemented or not, okay? So in order to do this research, uh, first of all, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we have uh, the hypothesis, okay? So, the current scenario, actually, uh, is that uh, we have way too much data breach incidents happen almost every single day. So if you open uh, any news site, you will easily see some news about uh, um, a major company, a major business, or even a small business being having his, uh, his data uh, stolen and, and leaked outside the company. Okay. So... Uh, the question is, if we have too much incidents and if we, if we have enough regulations, why this, this, this data breach incidents are still happening, you know? So 
we had the opportunity to be aware of the threat because uh, it, it gets pre presentation everywhere. And we, and we probably have regulations enough to help the companies preventing the data leak incidents. Okay. But as a position, instead of, uh, of reducing the number of incidents, data leak incidents are increasing year by year. Okay. So we did uh, an additional study, uh, almost in parallel with the Capital One study, uh, by the way, uh, that we realized that in 2019, we had 20, more than 22 billion uh, personal information leakage worldwide, you know. Uh, it's a huge number and it's a huge increase from 2018 and I'm sure that the figures from 2020 and from 2021 are, are greater, greater than the 2019-22 billion. So the, the bridge incidents are increasing over, over year by year. And we are still vulnerable. The incidents are still happening, you know. So why it's happening? So uh, do we have uh, global regulations, laws, and compliance requirements uh, to provide a proper guidance? Or, uh, sorry, we don't have the, the proper guidance or the companies are not uh, managing the, 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 the compliance requirements well enough. So they are still vulnerable besides the fact that we have uh, strong regulations and compliance requirements behind, okay? So this is, is, is the purpose of this uh, conversation. Uh, in order to do this research, uh, what we did, first of all, we, we, we got all the material that we had from the Capital One incident, okay? We understood the attack step by step, each step of the attack, we mapped it each step of the attack to the meet attack framework, okay, which is a very good and strong framework to understand uh, the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures behind a cyber attack. Okay, if you're not familiar with the meet attack, uh, you should because it's uh, it's it's free, it's open source, it's free available, and it's very good to understand how cyber attacks work. Okay, so we got the capital incident, we mapped each step of the attack to the meter attack framework. Okay, and based on the meter attack framework, uh, for each step of the attack, we map it the compliance uh, that we got, we got the attack step, we understood the attack step, we map it to meter attack. Meter attack also provide us uh, mitigation guidelines, and based on the mitigation guidelines, we map it then to the NIST cybersecurity framework, okay? And why NIST cybersecurity framework? Because it's also a strong framework uh, to understand potential mitigatory security controls for all sort of attacks and companies. So uh, it's a very well known, widely recognized at the global. Uh, it applies to every company for different segments and it's very, a uh, very strong framework to to provide uh, proper guidance on how, how to mitigate cyber attacks, okay? And also you can easily find on the internet or on, on, a, on a Google search uh, different documents that map the NIST cybersecurity framework to every single regulation or legislation that you have. So if you go to Google and say, oh, uh, how the NIST uh, Subcategory controls are related to, for example, uh, European GDPR. You, you Google, you can find. For local, your local legislation, you can usually find someone who had mapped the NIST cybersecurity framework to specific regulation, legislation, etc. Okay, so they are two good materials to help us understand how an attack works and how to prevent uh, cyber attacks. Okay. Um, so this is how uh, uh, how we did. And, and, and another reason to decide to study the Capital One incident is, is that we uh, different for the majority of cybersecurity incidents. In the Capital One case, we have plenty of information about the incident publicly available, including the investigatory reports that the FBI wrote down uh, to explain uh, how the attack uh, happened, 
how they were able to identify the attacker behind the attack and even the, the person was already arrested. Okay. So we have plenty of material public available about the incident. And of course, in order to provide to, to do such uh, research, we need such material. Okay. Uh, and the majority of incidents out there, we have almost no information available. You know, we barely have uh, the news reports saying, oh, the company X was attacked and that's all. Okay. For the capital one, as opposite, we have a lot of material. We have a lot of blog posts for companies and uh, security researchers discussing the attack. Okay. So we have a lot of information uh, in order to, prove, to, to do this sort of research, which is very useful. Okay, so talking uh, about about uh, about the Capital One Data Breach incident, uh, we 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 draw a uh, a quick and uh, brief timeline. So uh, let's move. Okay, uh, sorry, too much, too much. Okay, so uh, as I, as I said, the incident. Uh, was announced in July uh, 2019, okay, two years ago. Uh, but actually, the incident started a couple of months be before the incident was announced. Uh, actually, on March 12, 2019, the attacker, uh, Ms. Paige Thompson, uh, she had the first initial access to the Capital One infrastructure at AWS, okay? So, she was a former, a previous AWS employee, so she knew a lot about AWS, uh, how the infrastructure works, et cetera. So, had, so she had a, a strong background on, on cloud infrastructure, uh, but she was not, not working at AWS anymore by the time of the incident, okay? So she actually, she wrote and scripted uh, a shared script to search for vulnerable servers, exploiting specific vulnerability that she found. Okay. And actually she was able to, to attack more than 30 different companies in West. The Capital One was just the most famous target from her attack, for, for her attack. Uh, but she's not attacking just the Capital One actually. But, uh, again, Going back to the Capital One incident, that bridge incident, on March 12th, she was able to, to attack the Capital One infrastructure for the first time, okay? Uh, on April, next month, next month, on April 21st, she had the access to Capital One uh, S, S3 buckets, okay? So the, that, the database that Capital One had stored on AWS server, and she was able to copy to had access and to copy the data in more than 700 different S3 buckets, okay, containing customer data. Uh, so the, act, the actual incident, the actual data exfiltration happened on April 21st, okay? And uh, actually the incident goes totally unnoticed by the Capital One the cybersecurity team. So the incident took place on April 21st and no one noticed it. It's a huge serious problem, okay, a huge issue. Uh, and actually on July 17, or which means uh, April, May, June, July, four months after the data breach happened, the data leak happened, uh, someone, external researcher, found on GitHub uh, a page including some shell scripts that the researcher say, oh, this shell scripts looks like something from Capital One. And then this outsider researcher communicates, send an email to Capital One, to Capital Security Team, because Capital One has a responsible disclosure program. So they accept uh, incident reports from external parties, okay? And then this person send an email to Capital One, say, hey, I found this page on, on GitHub and it looks like something that belongs to you and something happened, so please take a look. And then actually uh, the Capital One security, security team uh, re received the email, started the investigation, uh, realized that they, their data was stolen, okay? And then they called the FBI, 911, called the Batman, etc. in the red phone. And then 
Uh, on two days later, on July 19, they went public and announced the breach. Okay, so again, the what is relevant about about this? First of all, the initial attack went unnoticed. No one realized that the data was breached and and leaked on April 21st, and the incident was only uh, detected because some someone, a uh, person outside the company. Tell them, hey, uh, I saw some data from you outside on, of your infrastructure. Okay, so the the, the incident went uh, totally totally unnoticed for more than, than four months. Okay, so it, it's clear that Capital One failed to detect the incident. So let's go ahead. Uh, then we we draw a draft of each step of the attack, so based on the FBI investigation report. Okay, so what happened? I will not go deep into details because otherwise we would spend like 30 minutes, one hour, two hours discussing the incident. But the attacker, uh, first of all, they she had her access because she was using Tor network and VPN services to hide their original IP address. And then she ran a SSF, SSRF query, a query, a side, side, a server side test forgery attack, okay? to trick the, the front end server who was running uh, a misconfigured web application file, okay? And basically, because of this, this misconfiguration in the web application file, the front, or the front end server uh, uh, received the, the malicious comments and forwarded back to, to the infrastructure the comments, okay? The SSS, SSRF uh, attack is like you, you send a request to a server, the server misinterpret it and forward it back to the back to the back end, believing that this is a real request. Okay, just a not show. Okay, so the Capital One had a front end server running a misconfigured web application firewall. So the web application firewall didn't detect and even didn't block the attack. Okay, so the malicious SSF query. Uh, was sent by the by Miss Paige Thompson, so she was able to access the EC2 metadata, metadata service, and then she was able to get uh, access credentials to the Capital One uh, infrastructure inside AWS. By using these credentials, she was able to access the entire infrastructure. She was able to run command line uh, comments in, in the run comments in the command line uh, interface of AWS. And then she was able to run comments like LS to list, to display the entire list of buckets uh, and servers available, okay? And then she also ran the command line command called sync to synchronize actually to copy the data on the cloud environment to their local computer, okay? By doing so, by running the sync command, she was able to copy the all the 700 uh, as the data inside the 700 uh, buckets on the AWS to copy to the computer, and then she was able to leak the Capstone data, which represented around 30 gigabytes of information. And everything happened without Capital One security noticing that this malicious access was happening. Someone using a Tor network was having access to the infrastructure. Someone using a Tor network was able to list their, their servers, get credentials, and if it's, it's the data. Okay. So based on these six steps of the attack, which means hide the access, run the malicious SSFR, SSRF query, uh, trick the misconfigured firewall to relay the command, uh, get the SF credentials, run the LS command, and then extract the data uh, using the sync command. So, this, so from these six different steps, we we then map it to different uh, NIST, uh, sorry, for from different NIST attack uh, categories. Like, for example, for the head access is, is equivalent to the T1188 multi hope proxy uh, category in the the meter attack framework and, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then based on each step for each 
uh, meat attack category. Okay, we identify the different uh, NIST uh, cybersecurity framework uh, uh, requirements as should be controls that would prevent the data breach to happen. Okay. So I will not go uh, again in details of each uh, of every one of these uh, steps for each of every one of these uh, mitigatory controls. Uh, you have them in the paper, okay? Because it takes way too long to discuss every single one, okay? But in a nutshell, in summary, uh, we identify a total of 61 potential missed CSF controls as actually sub categories that you means a mitigator, potential mitigatory control that would have per, helped preventing the cyber, the cyber attack to happen. Okay, so so from all the six different steps, in total we have 61 potential controls that if they were in place, they were properly implemented, they would help preventing the attack to happen. Okay, so as a comp so uh, in summary, the majority of these controls were related to vulnerability management, uh, to the, the, the security principle of the least privilege, which means you, don't, you only uh, provide user access or user privilege to, to perform the right job, okay, not unnecessary permissions. Uh, the lack of security event monitoring, okay, and also the lack of uh, implementing the proper security principles uh, in their infrastructure, okay? So again, we have different uh, mitigatory controls that may have been in place to help prevent the cyber attack. As an example, uh, if you consider, for example, the step uh, four, which is the exploring the web, the, the misconfigured web application firewall, okay? Uh, we have seven NIST CSF subcategories that were associated that would help preventing this specific step of attack, this specific vulnerability in the infrastructure. Okay, so during the, the initial attacks, when Ms. Paige Thompson she was able to explore the application firewall to uh, to send the malicious comments to a AWS metadata service. Uh, we had, again, the uh, misconfigured mod security web application firewall in place in the infrastructure, okay? And there are uh, seven different uh, NIST uh, subcategories that would help per detecting and preventing such issue to happen, okay? So, for example, if Capital One had a proper vulnerability management plan, okay, to identify such vulnerabilities, such misconfigured security tool, uh, if they had proper audit and log records, okay, and then using the, these logs, they would uh, collect the data and correlate them, and then monitoring this, these logs for an authorized personnel, okay, having access and exploiting the web, web application for misconfiguration, if they use the principal list will never miss this functionality, but probably the misconfiguration will never happen. Uh, if they had vulnerability scans, they would have to detect the vulnerability prior to the attack. And if they have detection of malicious activities properly in place, they would detect that someone was exploiting the application file, okay, and running a well-known uh, cybersecurity attack to the, to the application file, okay. So this is just one step of the attack, just for example. In the paper, we also describe uh, other ones. So you can, again, go back to the, to the paper and, and read with more details uh, our analysis of what happened. Uh, later, the US regulatory agencies, they investigate the attack. They decide, they, did, they realized that Capital One was to blame about the attack. And then they find it's Capital One because of the data breach, okay? And then we take a look, we took a look of the, 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 the regulatory report, the OCC report about the decision on finding the Capital One. And their conclusions about the attack were very similar to the conclusion that we had in our paper, okay? So according to the OCC, 
uh, capital one fails to, to, to establish a proper risk management process, okay, in order to uh, mitigate uh, any sort of potential cyber attack in, in the infrastructure, okay, uh, including uh, uh, proper risk mitigation for the cloud infrastructure. And then they also failed to identify uh, the, the weakness and the vulnerabilities in the infrastructure, okay? Uh, they, uh, even their internal audit, whenever they found some vulnerability or some issue, they were not able to effectively report the vulnerabilities to the top managers or to different areas and then having them working uh, properly to fix or to mitigate the vulnerabilities, okay? And the board, the company board was not held accountable for the for the vulnerabilities of the risk management process. So no one just care about that, okay? So their conclusions uh, match with our conclusions in our paper. And one second. So our conclusion is that unfortunately, Capital One really failed in having the proper risk management and compliance process to help preventing the data breach to happen. Okay. Uh, and we understand that they failed to implement the proper these uh, CSF security controls that would help them preventing. Uh, from out of the six to one, as mitigatory controls, uh, we believe that if you, some of them, uh, you don't need to have all of them totally in place, but if some of them were in place, it will be enough to prevent the cyber attack, okay? So in my personal opinion, for example, uh, you will you would never allow uh, an administrative access, a root access, a... Uh, uh, admin access to your infrastructure from the internet, from IIP, from uh, a Tor exit node, for example. I mean, this is for me, it's, it's so, it's so quite obvious that uh, your, your employee, your, your, your IT staff will never access your infrastructure to provide support or maintenance using a Tor network, for example. Okay, so if they just stop it, the attack, when they detected an uh, IP address on Tor network, it would be enough to prevent the attack, okay? And they didn't do that. So this is one of the part of the mitigatory controls that we, they could have in place. And again, they didn't detect the attack at all, so they don't have proper logging, monitoring, uh, event correlation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so we, we got a couple of key discussions about the, the cause of the attack, okay? Uh, <clears throat> our first discussion uh, is that there are lack of proper uh, mitigatory controls, okay? Uh, and why this happen? First of all, uh, we have a, a huge, I mean, it's good, it's good and bad at the same time, okay? Because for every regulation, legislation, or, or compliance framework that you have, you, you have a, a lot of requirements, and actually the company has the flexibility to define which requirements they want to implement or not, okay? Because uh, you have a general regulatory framework and then you have to adapt this framework to your own infrastructure, to your own reality, to, to our, our own risks, okay? So you have to have such flexibility, okay? So for example, out of the 100 and plus uh, mitigatory controls from the ISO, IEC, blah, 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 uh, you will decide to implement like 80 or 50 of them, et cetera. Uh, this, this at the same time, it's good because it provides flexibility to adapt the framework to our reality, but at the same time, you have the risk to just forgot implementing some key control, okay? So this flexibility is also a good and a, a issue at the same time. Uh, so the companies, they need to have uh, a proper control of how they are implementing the regulations, the security controls, the security the mitigatory controls that they need to implement. Okay, so the companies must be aware that you have the, the requirements and then you have to be sure that you're implementing the, the right requirements. So this is the first issue that we, we realized. The second one, 
uh, is the difficulty of in a large company to establish a proper a proper compliance management, a proper uh, infrastructure and people to provide the proper a proper uh, control of their compliance environment, the compliance in, in the requirements, the compliance framework at all. So uh, usually the companies, they use like the def defense model when we establish two or three lines of defense. Usually the end user, the, the employee is the first line of defense, which means you are working on a daily basis. If you find something weird, you have to uh, tell your bosses, tell security team, tell, tell the let the compliance team be aware that you find something weird, okay? Usually the second line of defense is the security and compliance team. Usually the third line of defense are the outsiders, like the our external auditors, external regulators, usually. So uh, sometimes your end user finds an issue uh, why they are reporting to the security team and why the compliance team are working on establishing a mitigatory control. Someone just attacked that company using the, the issue that you just realized that you have, okay? So sometimes the attacker, they exploit this time window, the gap between your figure out you have an issue and being able to fix the issue, okay? Uh, <clears throat> which means that you, it's very important to have a very strong compliance management in place. So you realize, you understand as fast as possible that you have risks and you, you be able to fix such or mitigate such risks as soon as possible. And so it's a, it's a usual issue that majority of our companies they have. Okay. Uh, in the Capital One uh, case in particular, uh, we figured out that they also have a uh, people management issue as well, okay? So by the end of the day, it's all about people, you know? So uh, it's very well understood that the, the, the security incident happened because of the capital and all infrastructure. I mean, oh, it's hosted in the cloud, but the, the final responsibility is from the capital and security team, okay? To provide proper security to their cloud infrastructure. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, Capital One was very well recognized of techie, savvy, uh, a very strong bank, you know. Uh, they actually, they had a very strong security team in the company that worked peer-to-peer -peer with AWS uh, engineering. They, they also helped uh, AWS engineers building better security tools, by the way. But at the same point of time, they changed their CISO. Okay, and all of a sudden, uh, the security team was faced with a toxic culture. Uh, everything was working very well, they changed the season, and oh, all of a sudden, the work was just crappy, okay? Uh, people started leaving the company, uh, so they have a huge high turnover, and actually, almost one thirty of the security employees left the company, uh, in, in like in months, a few months, okay? And can you imagine the impact of, have, of having one third of your employees living in the company? You are missing the skilled people. You are missing a lot of knowledge, okay? People that knows too much about the infrastructure, that knows too much about the top, and you are replacing for new staff. So they have a long time to learn the new job, the new infrastructure, etc. So this, this issue with, uh, Toxic leadership uh, actually helps uh, creating an environment that the human error will be part of the cause of things. Okay, so part of the cause the cause of uh, the breach is that the security team uh, had such an issue, kind of issue. And then, uh, when you consider everything, what what's our recommendations? Um, what so initially uh, uh, this session actually it, uh, this session happens it's not in our pa original paper but uh, we presented exactly this 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 exact same slide deck to a RSA, RSA conference uh, two months ago and in their RSA conference they are uh, they required all the speakers to provide an apply session saying oh okay 
besides of everything I said, so what are our recommendations? What, what are our practical recommendations? Okay, so so we did. So let's just see. Uh, the, the slide transition was not very good. Okay, the, the presenter is not very good. Uh, so our recommendations for immediate action. So go back to your company and start doing so. Is first of all to review the most recent uh, compliance reports. So you you probably have had some compliance audits a uh, couple of days, weeks, or months ago, and then take a look of your latest audit reports and check if everything is okay. Okay, look for potential weakness or potential vulnerabilities for critical vulnerabilities and start addressing them. Start addressing the most critical issues that you just realized you have. Be sure that you're addressing them. Okay, don't leave anything behind. Don't send everything down the carpets. Okay, just start working on your latest audit report and start checking if everything is well done. Okay. Double check your security controls, uh, including for cloud computing infrastructure. Okay, this is a, is a huge mistake that we usually uh, see around in the industry. You have strong uh, mitigatory controls for our, your, your on premise infrastructure, actually, because everyone is very used to do security in the on premise infrastructure for ages. Okay, so uh, since I was young, I had, I, I had, I had hair. Okay, we are talking about security um, in our infrastructure, in our company, in our physical network, like firewalls, IDS, IPS, antivirus, anti-PT, uh, spam control, whatever, whatever, whatever. But we are not still very well on doing uh, security in the cloud infrastructure. Okay, so we have to be sure that all our security controls and mitigatory controls that they apply to our physical infrastructure also apply or they have similar controls uh, to protect our uh, infrastructure on the cloud. Okay. So this is for the next week. For the, the, the medium time frame for the next month, what we recommend? To review your vulnerability management process to be sure it's good, it's working, you have proper tools, for vulnerability management, uh, the vulnerabilities to detect have been addressed to, uh, by the security team. Okay, uh, in all the uh, critical, severe, or critical uh, vulnerabilities have been fixed as soon as possible. Okay, so review your vulnerability management process. Review also your audit process. Okay, uh, in order to be sure that you have the proper security, security controls uh, in place. Okay, uh, be sure that you comply with the most relevant uh, security frameworks that you have in your industry, like NIST, ISO, uh, GDPR, PCI, whatever. Okay, so I, I'm sure you know a, a couple of uh, security compliance uh, frameworks that you have to be, uh, uh, you have to adhere, okay? So be sure that you comply with the most relevant ones. Uh, and even though, uh, even if you, if you are aware of some security best practices, and even if the, the, the security framework of your choice doesn't explicitly recommend them, be sure to follow all security best practices possible. Okay, uh, least privilege, uh, Defensive death, whatever, name it, name it. Okay, be sure that you comply with the best press that you have available. Okay, and also uh, be sure to keep your security controls relevant and in place, even if you change the technology. If you move to the physical data center to the cloud, if you even start using IoT or whatever, okay, uh, your Security and mitigatory controls must be in place, uh, even if you are running different products, different services, different uh, programming languages, etc. Okay, it applies to every, to everything. And uh, from uh, a longer time period, like uh, six months, uh, 
be sure to manage your what we, we we call the compliance window. So the time between you find an issue or you have compliance requirements and you fix, you, you, you provide the proper mitigation. Uh, we we understand that companies, at least the, the huge, large companies, they should have something similar to the traditional SOC uh, and NOC. So the network operation center, the security operation center that we usually have in our large organizations. Why we don't have a governance operation center? Okay, why we don't have a team, a dedicated security team that is 24 hours per seven looking for comp uh, for uh, compliance regulatory requirements, if they are in place, if they are properly implemented, if they are working as we expected, okay? So we recommend that companies start thinking about building a specific team just to work with the governance and compliance as that we already have with security and network operation, okay? A governance operation center, GOC. Uh, that would help us providing ongoing monitoring, okay? And detecting any issue as soon as possible and working hard to fix them as fast as possible as well. Last but not least, uh, we remember that uh, you also have to work uh, on providing proper leadership uh, uh, team and uh, leadership team to manage your IT and security team. Okay, so uh, having a strong leadership is crucial for cybersecurity. So having people motivated, trained, engaged on their job. Okay, uh, people is is a strong part of the security ecosystem. So we have our leadership realizing that and keeping the employees moral, strong and people motivated and people aware of their work, aware of the importance of the work. Okay. Uh, you have you have to have organizational culture uh, where people help each other. Instead of finger pointing, you have to be more proactive, you know? So instead of just whenever you have a security incident, just figure pointing and trying to figure out who is responsible for what, uh, we have to, to treat it different. Okay, so we have the learning opportunities. So let's improve our infrastructure, our people, our process, our technologies instead of just finger pointing. Okay, uh, work. We had in order to do that, we have to work with our HR, with our uh, company leadership uh, team in order to provide a proper, uh, uh, strong and friendly uh, company culture uh, and working on police rotation policies. And we, when, whenever you think about the cybersecurity industry, uh, we have a strong, a huge issue with lack of security professionals. We have a, a huge gap between the number of professionals that we need in the industry and the number of professionals that we have nowadays. And our universities, our, uh, our schools, they, they were not able to provide the, the number of professionals that we need nowadays, okay? So uh, I think in the, the latest figures from ISA Square is that we need around 3 million people to work in cybersecurity to, to fill the gap between what we need and what we have today. So it's a lot of people, which means that the security industry uh, lacks good and strong professionals. So if you have one good professional, take care of him, of her, okay? Uh, work with him or her to to have this this person in your company, to have a, a strong, a, a, a good environment to work and to attract good professionals as well, okay? So people is a strong part of your security posture and keeping the strong professionals is very important as well. So, okay, so this is the most relevant tops that we have from my presentation. Uh, I hope you find them useful. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the full paper is available. So you can just go to the website and download the paper, take a look, read, and send us any comments that you have. And I would be glad to answer your questions if we have a couple of time.
And thank you for your time. Eh, muchas gracias por el tiempo. Muchas gracias. Uh, si tiene pregunta, puede preguntar en español. Yo contesto en español, en inglés, en portugués, o en portugués, o cualquier cosa así. Correcto. Muchas gracias, Sanchises, por tu explicación. Excelente el análisis del caso de Capital One. Definitivamente creo que este, a todos nos ha llamado bastante la, la atención, ¿no? Porque siempre enterarnos de brechas de seguridad a escalas tan grandes eh, siempre nos hace conscientes de que en algún momento nos puede pasar a nosotros también, ¿no? Definitivamente este, se aprende bastante de, de estos casos, ¿no? Y, y contribuye al mejoramiento de del conocimiento y, y por ende la ciberseguridad que podamos este, aprender, ¿no? Y bueno, y definitivamente, ¿no? Comprender la importancia que tienen los roles de equipos multidisciplinarios, ¿no? Y, y, y la importancia del factor humano eh, para crear cultura y sobre todo concientización. Bueno, este caso del banco sí que compromete mucho la, a, a la, la confianza de los clientes y, y bueno, y se debe trabajar bastante so, sobre ello, ¿no? Bueno, ahora pasamos a la ronda de preguntas. A ver, permíteme dar una breve revisión, a ver si tenemos algunas preguntas en interno. A ver, bueno, aquí tenemos este, una primera este, pregunta. Este, Sánchez, en tu opinión, eh, ¿con, ¿con qué deberíamos complementar el cumplimiento de las normas? Uh -huh. uh... <coughs> Eh, en, en mi opinión, eh, primero, eh, usted necesita tener un equipo de seguridad eh, muy fuerte, ¿sí? con personas con experiencia. ¿sí? Entonces, eh, es claro que sería excelente si, si solamente tuviéramos, tuviésemos eh, profesionales senior, muy expertos, casi ninja en el equipo. Pero tenemos que tener una mezcla ¿sí? de profesionales que están empezando la carrera, en, en empleo y con personales senior, porque en muchos casos es la experiencia personal que lo, le apoya. ¿sí? Usted, nosotros tenemos la, las guidelines de las, de las reglamentaciones, de las leyes. Uh, pero lo que va a decir, uh, si basado en las guidelines, lo que vamos a implementar es uh, proceso, ¿sí? Uh, un plan muy claro de análisis de riesgo, de, de que usted conozca el escenario de riesgo de, de tu empresa, y entonces para qué esfuerzo usted tiene que enfocar su, su energía, ¿sí? su equipo, uh, y la experiencia que va, de, que va a te decir, uh, yo tengo lo, los requerimientos, yo voy, de los, por ejemplo, de los 10 requerimientos, yo necesito implementar nueve de ellos, pero además de estos nueve, hay algunas cosas que no estaban en los requerimientos que yo debo implementar también. ¿sí? Entonces, esa es mucho de la experiencia. E incluso eh, conocimiento de, de las diferentes tecnologías, o sea, uh, y que las personas tengan la capacidad, la disponibilidad de se mantener eh, actualizadas con la tecnología. O sea, eh, antigamente teníamos los mainframes, que después migramos para los data centers, con los servidores, después ahora cambiamos para la nube, ¿sí? Y hoy tenemos empresas que están 100% en la nube, por ejemplo. Uh, por ejemplo, nosotros de Six Bank tenemos 100% de nuestra infraestructura basada en la nube. No tenemos data center físico, no tenemos casi nada de servidor físico en nuestra oficina, casi nada. ¿sí? Uh, entonces, usted tiene que tener... Um, Profesionales que son expertos en seguridad y en seguridad en los, las nuevas tecnologías como la nube. ¿Sí? Entonces, es una mezcla de uh, conocer los requerimientos existentes actuales, uh, saber, ¿no? tener un proceso de análisis de riesgo e implementar para que implemente los requerimientos que sean necesarios y la, la capacidad, la experiencia de se mantener actualizado Así que la tecnología se evolve, se cambia. Ya no mezclo. Correcto, Chávez. Sí, tienes mucha razón en eso. Bueno, este, también quería preguntarte algo, estoy a título personal. Este, eh, en tu opinión nuevamente, este, ¿qué crees que complica que una organización tan grande como un banco eh, no haga una implementación este, apropiada para, de algunos marcos de trabajo que, que van en función a la normativa que, que toda institución de este rubro debe cumplir? Es que el problema, 
Aí, quando as empresas se quedam muito grandes, assim, demasiadamente grandes, é, você, às vezes, se toma muito mais tempo fazendo burocracia do que fazendo trabalho, sim? Né? Então, os, os gerentes se toma muito mais tempo renando burocracia, contestando a correios, do que geralmente maneando sua equipe, maneando a infraestrutura, sim? Né? Então, você tem que, você depende que la, las, las personas de nivel técnico hacen su trabajo, ¿sí? Mientras los gerentes están haciendo la burocracia, ¿sí? Y, y que yo ya tuve experiencia en otras empresas que yo trabajé en, en vida profesional, es que generalmente, cuanto más alto está en la infraestructura, en la estructura de la organización, menos visibilidad de lo que acontece de verdad usted tiene. Entonces, el gerente no sabe 100% lo que son los equipos de trabajo y el, gerente, el director conoce casi nada de la realidad. O sea, el director piensa que está todo seguro abajo, la infraestructura está protegida, sí, está muy segura, pero el gerente sabe que es más o menos, pero no va a decir la verdad para el director. ¿sí? Mientras el lo, lo profesional sabe que está tudo malo, <risos> sí? que está más configurado, es que no tiene budget para uh, hacer la compra de la herramienta, para poner una licencia más grande, porque se aumentó el número de usuarios. Entonces, mientras el profesional técnico está todo loco, preocupado, el gerente está más o menos, el director piensa que está todo lindo. ¿sí? Y esto se pasa mucho en grandes empresas, muy grandes, ¿sí? como grandes bancos, grandes empresas de telefonía, el gobierno, ¿sí? la, la, las personas en cargos muy altos, ellos no tienen la visibilidad. Y esto eh, se pasa por qué? Porque nosotros en seguridad también no sabemos manejar muy bien la burocracia de compliance, de crear métricas de seguridad, ¿sí? de, de explicar para la, los, los gerentes más altos eh, las métricas relevantes, ¿sí? Entonces, lo que se pasa es que eh, cuanto más alto está bebiendo en un, un sueño. ¿sí? Piensan que está todo bonito, pero en verdad no está. Muy y cierto. las personas de abajo no saben cómo explicar esto, porque generalmente las personas de, de, del día a día son técnicos que no saben hablar la lengua de lo gerente. No saben eh, explicar para él que, oh, mira, esto es importante. ¿sí? Usted, usted no necesita saber el... Three-way handshake protocol de SSL, pero se necesita saber que nuestro certificado de SSL eh, va, necesita ser renovado la próxima semana, por ejemplo. Sí. No, definitivamente, ¿no? La maniobrabilidad para gestionar el cambio a nivel técnico se complica cuando este, no hay esa comunicación, ¿no? O sea, como que ese, ese puente a veces entre la parte ejecutiva y la parte técnica a veces este, no, no es salvado correctamente, ¿no? Este, y definitivamente sí, eso, eso ocasiona, ¿no? Y, y se dan organizaciones de, 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 de toda escala. Bueno, aquí tengo una pregunta adicional, dices, a ver, eh, bueno, algo importante, ¿no? ¿Qué principales enseñanzas podemos tomar de este caso? Uh, en mi opinión, sí, eh, Primero, la importancia de los controles de regulatorios y cómo tu estrategia de compliance los maneja. O sea, usted sabe que tiene controles de seguridad que tiene que tener en su infraestructura. Entonces, cómo usted maneja estos controles, cómo usted monitorea si los controles están implementados, están bien hechos, están funcionando. Entonces, este para mí es el primer punto. Y segundo, es como eh, te olvides los controles, te olvides la burocracia, ¿sí? Pensa desde el punto de vista de seguridad, ¿cuáles son las buenas prácticas? ¿Sí? Como principio de, de, de privilegio mínimo, eh, de, de, de defensa en capas, ¿sí? Entonces, ¿cuáles son los controles de seguridad que nosotros aprendemos, conocemos cuando empezamos a trabajar con seguridad? ¿Usted tiene, tiene ellos en práctica? Usted los tiene implementado en su organización. Entonces, por ejemplo, uh, uh, como, como yo deciste, ¿sí? uh, la, el atacante accedió a la infraestructura de nube de Capital One uh, basada en la red de Tor. ¿sí? Mira, si usted va en Google, usted baja listas de direcciones IP de, 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 de los nodes de, de salida de la red de Tor, ¿por qué no hace un blacklist? ¿Sí? 
Uh, ¿O por qué no hace un whitelist? Solamente asciende a la infraestructura en la nube uh, para manutención los usuarios de la red corporativa. O, por ejemplo, ahora que estamos en pandemia, que las personas están en home office, solamente tiene posibilidad de ascender la infraestructura como eh, administrador, como root, uh, los profesionales que tienen un dispositivo de la compañía, ¿sí? con, con una computadora, con un, certificado digital, un certificado digital o algún control de seguridad que usted tenga de cierto que esta es la, la ordenadora de la empresa, que no es una, una atacante, por ejemplo. Entonces, uh, esto para mí es el principio básico de seguridad, ¿sí? además de, de las reglamentaciones, de la gobernanza, de los controles de auditoría, yo como profesional de seguridad tengo que pensar, mira, yo tengo que tener los controles básicos. Uh, y el peor, ¿por qué un ataque se pasa en infraestructura? ¿sí? Alguien accede a mi servidor, hace el robo de, de 700 bases de datos con más de 30 gigas de información y ninguna herramienta de seguridad me alarma. ¿sí? Mira, sí, uh, hay alguna mis, ma, ma, mala configuración y, y, y mi infraestructura de monitoreo. Entonces, son las grandes eh, aprendizajes, en mi opinión, la debilidad por tema del control de compliance, de monitoreo, de los requerimientos de compliance, incluso la debilidad de mi infraestructura de seguridad que estaba eh, operando para que alguien ascienda de una forma que sería muy sencillo de detectar y alguien hace una, una invasión que nadie lo detectó. Definitivamente sí, ¿no? Tenemos que siempre considerar esas, esas situaciones, ¿no? Realmente a veces, como se dice, al hacer doble clic sobre cada ítem o sea, cada, cada elemento de nuestra checklist, este, nos damos cuenta que está muy, muy lleno de detalles a, a considerar. Sí. Correcto. Ok. Este, bueno, este, invito a, a Henry a que se una este, a la conversación. Henry, excelente, estamos aquí los tres, ya prácticamente con esta charla, estamos cerrando el primer día de, de esta jornada. Este, bueno, ya este, quisiéramos este, que te dirijas al público de 8.8 Andina para poder este, este, ayudarnos aquí este, a, a cerrar aquí y, y tus palabras de despedida a Chises. Ok, so, eh, muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad de presentar acá en 8.8 perdón eh, muchísimas gracias, es muy importante eh, el evento sí, eh, y que es un evento por toda la Latinoamérica, ¿sí? entonces felicitaciones a todos ustedes por el evento Excelente. Acá le damos el pase a nuestro, a nuestro colega, este Henry Hoyos. Henry, adelante. Bueno, la verdad que muy contento por, por este primer día. Creo que estamos cerrando justo a tiempo. Estaba programado para las 5 de, de Bolivia, 4 de Perú que íbamos a cerrar. Y creo que el primer gran objetivo se cumplió con algunos contratiempos porque, como lo hemos repetido, esto está en vivo, así que es normal eso de ahí. Eh, me sumo a los agradecimientos, Anchise, gracias por, por aportar ese granito de arena, gracias por querer compartir tus conocimientos con toda la comunidad de 8.8 Andina, de corazón te decimos gracias a todos, he visto que el público ha estado eh, interactuando y, y eso, es, eso es un, nos llena la verdad de, de, de felicidad después de, de, de estar casi dos meses y medio, tres meses en la preorganización de este evento, esto es lo que, lo que te hace cargar las energías nuevamente, así que gracias Anchise y bueno, para mañana los invitamos nuevamente a, a, a las casi un poco más de mil personas que nos han estado siguiendo de 19 países diferentes, la verdad que ha estado presente eh, Europa, han estado presente gente de, de, de Norteamérica, Centroamérica, creo que mañana se nos unen más países todavía porque tenemos muy buenas presentaciones, mañana tenemos un keynote de lujo, que lo va a estar dirigiendo aquí mi, mi colega Grover Córdoba. Eh, en el caso mío, yo voy a estar dirigiendo el panel de Hacker versus ISO y tenemos también otras ponencias de lujo para el día de mañana, por lo cual quedan todos invitados para mañana. Estamos arrancando a las 10 horas de Chile y de Bolivia, a las 9 horas de Perú. 
Así que sin más preámbulo, una vez, mil gracias a todos y quedan cordialmente invitados para mañana. Gracias, eh, Grover, gracias, Anchise. Gracias a todos, este, gracias Henry, gracias Anchise, este, gracias a toda la comunidad que se ha mantenido hasta el último, aquí este, valoramos mucho eso, este, es recompensado nuestro esfuerzo al tener a ustedes su permanencia, ¿no? Entonces nos despedimos y bueno, nos estamos viendo el día de mañana. Chao, chao comunidad. Gracias comunidad. Ok, gracias a todos. Bye. Gracias. Listo, excelente. Bueno, bueno chiste. terminamos juntos, señores. Cinco minutos. Sí, excelente. Ha sido todo igual y cronometrado. Gracias. Listo. Gracias, Anchi. Listo, Anchi. Un gran saludo. Nos vemos mañana. Listo. Chao. Chao. Descanse.